best Sigmund Freud quotes. Don't forget to subscribe. Just as no one can be forced into belief, so no one can be forced into unbelief. One day, in retrospect, the years of struggle will strike you as the most beautiful. The great question that has never been answered, and which I have not yet been able to answer, despite my 30 years of research into the feminine soul, is what does a woman want? He that has eyes to see and ears to hear may convince himself that no mortal can keep a secret. If his lips are silent, he chatters with his fingertips, betrayal oozes out of him at every pore. The intention that man should be happy is not in the plan of creation. We are never so defenseless against suffering as when we love. I cannot think of any need in childhood as strong as the need for a father's protection. Being entirely honest with oneself is a good exercise. We are never so defenseless against suffering as when we love. Where does a thought go when it's forgotten? A woman should soften but not weaken a man. Experience teaches us that the world is not a nursery. Future ages will produce further great advances in this realm of culture, probably inconceivable now, and will increase man's likeness to a god still more. It is impossible to escape the impression that people commonly use false standards of measurement. Words have a magical power. They can bring either the greatest happiness or deepest despair. It is that we are never so defenseless against suffering as when we love, never so helplessly unhappy as when we have lost our loved object or its love. Religion is an attempt to get control over the sensory world in which we are placed, by means of the wish world, which we have developed inside us as a result of biological and psychological necessities. He does not believe that does not live according to his belief. When making a decision of minor importance, I have always found it advantageous to consider all the pros and cons. Everywhere I go I find a poet has been there before me. Religion is a system of wishful illusions together with a disavowal of reality. Life, as we find it, is too hard for us, it brings us too many pains, disappointments and impossible tasks. In the depths of my heart, I can't help being convinced that my dear fellow men, with a few exceptions, are worthless. Neurotics complain of their illness, but they make the most of it, and when it comes to taking it away from them they will defend it like a lioness her young. Words are capable of arousing the strongest emotions and prompting all men's actions.
the ego is not master in its own house. The voice of the intellect is a soft one, but it does not rest until it has gained a hearing. The ego refuses to be distressed by the provocations of reality, to let itself be compelled to suffer. The pleasure of satisfying a savage instinct, undomesticated by the ego, is uncomparably much more intense than the one of satisfying a tamed instinct. Where ID was, their ego shall be. In mourning, it is the world which has become poor and empty, in melancholia, it is the ego itself. One might compare the relation of the ego to the ID with that between a rider and his horse. It is easy to see that the ego is that part of the ID which has been modified by the direct influence of the external world. Every normal person, in fact, is only normal on the average. His ego approximates to that of the psychotic in some part or other and to a greater or lesser extent. Analysis does not set out to make pathological reactions impossible, but to give the patient's ego freedom to decide one way or another. Children are completely egoistic, they feel their needs intensely and strive ruthlessly to satisfy them. The functional importance of the ego is manifested in the fact that normally control over the approaches to motility devolves upon it. Towards the outside, at any rate, the ego seems to maintain clear and sharp lines of demarcation. The poor ego has a still harder time of it, it has to serve three harsh masters, and it has to do its best to reconcile the claims and demands of all three. At the height of being in love the boundary between ego and object threatens to melt away. The repressed merges into the ID as well, and is merely a part of it. Originally the ego includes everything, later it detaches from itself the external world. There is no doubt that the resistance of the conscious and unconscious ego operates under the sway of the pleasure principle. The ego represents what we call reason and sanity, in contrast to the ID which contains the passions. Neurosis is the result of a conflict between the ego and its ID. A transference neurosis corresponds to a conflict between ego and ID. The repressed is only cut off sharply from the ego by the resistances of repression, it can communicate with the ego through the ID. The ego feeling we are aware of now is thus only a shrunken vestige of a far more extensive feeling. The ego is first and foremost a bodily ego, it is not merely a surface entity, but is itself the projection of a surface. Everyone has wishes which he would not like to tell to others, which he does not want to admit even to himself. The virtuous man contents himself with dreaming that which the wicked man does in actual life.
We are what we are because we have been what we have been. Dreams may be thus stated, they are concealed realizations of repressed desires. Dreams with a painful content are to be analyzed as the fulfillment of wishes. Dream disfigurement, then, turns out in reality to be an act of the sensor. If youth knew, if age could. Being entirely honest with oneself is a good exercise. Thank you for watching, don't forget to subscribe and check out videos you see on the screen, have a good day.